estrellita en mi, en la página de Google en mi cuenta por si acaso tengo que entrar a un programa a algún programa. Aquí está tu cuenta. Ah. Esta es tu cuenta. Perfecto. Y me interesa todo bien. Perfecto. Entonces ya. Vale. Todo bien. Okay. ¿Eh? I want to introduce you, so... Yeah. So, hello everyone. Today is the third day of presentation of Human Civil Residency. And now, uh, Lisette and I, we're going to talk about AI and Metaverse. So, I hope you enjoy it. And sorry again for the delay. Okay. Where are you going? The presentation? Here. Yes, but I need... Aquí está. Bueno. Good morning everyone. Thank you for coming and being today with us. So today we're going to talk about AI and creativity. Uh, my name is Lisette Lemos. I work in the Artificial Intelligence Research Institute here in, in Spain. It's part of the uh, Scientific Council for Research in Spain. So my main work is uh, about dissemination. I'm not a proper researcher, but I'm trying to uh, help our researchers to reach the society. Yeah? We <coughs> have been also collaborating uh, with this project, which is called Artificia. And Artificia is a platform that has this mission, the mission of disseminating uh, the knowledge of AI, uh, in particular through the arts. So, <coughs> so let's, in, in this uh, presentation, we will, we will do mainly an intro, introduction uh, about AI for uh, creative industries and also uh, Mark also will talk about how AI is impacting in the metaverse development. We will do <coughs> so we will I, I will use several videos to, to do the, the presentation more enjoyable so uh, we will uh, see how uh, artificial intelligence is changing the creative industries. We will, some, uh, we will explain what is AI, uh, how AI is in the industry, in arts mainly, and so we can reflect about if a machine can create or not. So we will see ethics, uh, problems uh, related with the development and the application of AI in our society, and then we see some application of AI in the metaverse. So how artificial intelligence is changing the creative industry, so uh, artificial intelligence uh, is changing everything in mm -hmm. our society, so, but uh, I, will, I will show you uh, this uh, interesting uh, uh, video. Should we turn the lights off? Yeah, maybe probably it's better. This one? Yeah, this one. Yeah, this one. You have to just plug out. Oh, Thank you. Yeah, maybe we can change this one. There's. Uh, this one's I don't know. Okay. So more or less the videos are four minutes, five minutes, so uh, we can stop any time that you want. Eh? Hello, yeah. mm. I don't know. No. Well, the speakers. But. Yeah? Well, the technical things yeah. <laughs> take times. <laughs> Output speakers. 
These portraits might look like paintings from centuries gone by, or digital art created by human hands, but they're not. Each one has been imagined and created by an artificial intelligence. It's the brainchild of Mario Klingerman. He's leading a group of artists who are pioneering the use of AI in the world of visual arts. As an artist, you are always in this interplay between accident and control. Using AI allows me to find a good balance between the two. This artwork is created using neural networks, computer programs that mimic the structure of the human brain. Mario has trained the system on thousands of portraits from the 17th to 19th centuries. The AI learns from them and creates a never-ending stream of unique portraits. In the past decade, the use of AI has expanded into numerous creative fields and its role is continuing to grow. Marcus de Sotoy is a professor of mathematics at the University of Oxford. I think a lot of people think that all that AI could possibly do is to produce more of the same, to produce pastiche. And I think that's really missing an opportunity because this AI is really beginning to push the boundaries, change things, uh, disrupt things. And so I think we're really seeing something very special happening at this moment. For those working in creative fields, AI is more likely to emerge as a collaborator than a competitor. I think it's going to change jobs, and that's the point. So this is a new collaborator, a new tool, a bit like the arrival of the camera on the scene that really changed art. Um, so I think there'll be art that will be just the same as it ever was, but there'll be new jobs out there. Some jobs will go, but for example, I think there'll be something like the data curator, the person who curates the data that the AI will learn on, will be a very creative role in the whole process. Concerns about the long-term impact of AI are shared by musicians like Holly Herndon, who composes by collaborating with one. She calls it Spawn. She's my AI baby. We've been teaching her how to sing, how to make music with us. Holly's worried that there are no intellectual property laws or other regulations in place to protect artists from AI-powered imitations. Just from this conversation that we've had today, you would have enough audio material to be able to make a model of my speaking voice and kind of do whatever you want. We simply cannot have this wholesale taking of each other's work. And so I think we have to move past some of our 20th century uh, logics around IP um, and the way that we dealt with that and, and come up with a new framework for that for the 21st century. I like how innocent it sounds. <laughs> But Holly has a more optimistic vision for the future of AI in the creative arts. One characterised less by imitation and more by originality. So by layering this, we were able to kind of get the, the AI singing with the kind of real world singing and instrumentation to kind of meld together and occupy the same space. AI's capacity to help humans make new kinds of art seems likely to have the most impact on the creative industries and the livelihoods of those working in them in the years ahead. But what then? How far does AI's potential to disrupt human creativity stretch? I think there will come a moment when we have to regard the AI as a sort of independent entity that is being creative. And maybe that's when it has its own internal world, when it perhaps AI becomes conscious in its own right, which I believe will happen at some point. There is uh, an interaction that AI can have with the art of the past, which is at a speed that we could never achieve. So I think there is some possibility for AI to, to reach a, a state of uh, creativity much faster than we did as humans. Okay. 
So, okay, so we, we, we see, no? we, we are seeing that there are many uh, projects that is currently applying AI in a kind of successful uh, artistic way. But, uh, but what is AI? No? What is the artificial intelligence? So, artificial intelligence is a discipline. It's a discipline that leverages computers and machines to mimic uh, problem solving and decision making capacity of the human. So, um, this is artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence uh, was. Uh, is related with the human dream of creating machines uh, similar to us. It's the always human human dream. So in in, in the 14th century, uh, Ramon Yu, the philosopher, Catalan philosopher, already uh, thought about the possibility of implementing human reasoning in a machine. Uh, later on, in, in the 50s, in 1950, uh, uh, Alan Turing, the father of the computer, the computer science and the informatics, um, in a very famous uh, article, uh, defined or tried to define what to be a, an intelligent machine, and uh, in this uh, famous article, he defines uh, the imitation game, so uh, the, the, a, a kind of the, 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 the well known uh, Turing test, which try to uh, systematize how we can say when a machine is an intelligent machine. So, this is the a Turing test. It was defined in the in the 50s. Then in, in 1956 in Dortmund, in the University of Dortmund, uh, the discipline was born uh, um, and it, it took the name of artificial intelligence. So it's a, it's a, it's a relatively new discipline but this is a discipline that has been uh, developing uh, very much in these uh, last 10 years. <coughs> so, uh, as uh, for the definition, so artificial intelligence is a branch of the computer science, implementation of an intelligent behavior, and uh, there are different type of artificial intelligence uh, in, the, in the research, in the scientific and industrial world. There are two types, they say weak artificial intelligence or a strong artificial intelligence. What we are seeing uh, today uh, of artificial intelligence is the weak or narrow. So there are algorithms that are capable to solve some specific tasks. Um, they don't have the capacity of the human brain at all. So a strong AI is the, the type of AI that uh, is intended to be like our brain, you know, uh, able for uh, execute with one algorithm, no, uh, any task, no. Uh, now, if you have an algorithm for uh, recommending uh, products to a user, that is, uh, is recommendation systems are algorithms uh, part of many commercial products like uh, Amazon or in the e-commerce in, in, in general. These algorithms are good doing this, so they can recommend you products, but you cannot use these algorithms to do another task. So this is very, very important, but uh, there are 
of course, research on trying to find more general uh, models, models that you can use to solve these different problems. <coughs> so, talking about artificial intelligence in general, so this is a, a small video uh, of a this is a, a work that uh, has been done in our institute, in the Artificial Intelligence Research Institute. And this is a little example of a research. Uh, in this case, this is an IQ uh, robot. And uh, it, uh, we here have been exploring, in uh, particular, this, uh, this uh, PhD this is, is uh, made by Arturo Rivas uh, under the direction of Ramon Romero Levantara and Jesus Arquides. And they are trying to explore a kind of algorithms that is called active learning. And uh, active learning algorithms are um, algorithms that try to um, um, learn or uh, activate the learning process without a lot of data, so more similar to our uh, way of we learn with few examples. Okay, this is a so in in this case, so the, the robot. Uh, one model for the learning process and one model for the uh, hands, for the hands. And if we, uh, the algorithms tell him when he makes mistakes and based on these errors, they convert it, he corrects the errors and learn the sequence of music that the system presents to him. So, so this is a this is a little example of a project that well, is a, we do here in Barcelona uh, with the collaboration of other researchers. But uh, okay, so this is artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is a, is a broader term, but uh, currently we see uh, that uh, there are many subfields of artificial intelligence. Uh, among these subfields, we have uh, machine learning, and inside machine learning, we have uh, deep learning. Uh, they are usually now. Uh, um, mentioned in, conju in conjunction with artificial intelligence. So, but uh, I think that it's interesting for you to know that we have uh, artificial intelligence that uh, is trying to implement different capacities of the human beings. And machine learning is more uh, dedicated to the process of learning. No, learning, uh, basically learning based on data. Uh, data can be any data that we already uh, produce uh, through our different digital systems. And what the algorithm does is to make predictions or support the decision making process. So, uh, there is another field that I, is interesting to mention, which is multi-agent systems, that is more the in collective intelligence. So, uh, machine learning represents uh, a learning uh, from the point of view of an individual, uh, mimic the learning process of a person, 
However, for example, multi-agent system, is so they are algorithms that try to represent collective behavior. So <coughs> this is uh, interesting to, to mention. Um, the other, so uh, talking about uh, machine learning, we specifically this uh, part is a machine learning system. Uh, it's a computer system that can be broken into three parts. So first the da data set, uh, the data set which is a collection of data. Uh, it can be include uh, many data, so we are surrounded by data right now. So uh, then uh, the second part is the algorithm itself. Uh, in this part, uh, there are two two parts of an artificial a machine learning uh, system, which is the part of the learning part, so when you create a model based on the data, of the input data, and once you have this model, you have the second part of the, the, the system that is the one that makes the prediction or the decision. So a prediction or decision can be anything like a the next video that you uh, would like in YouTube or uh, for example if an email is a spam or not a, is a or it doesn't okay so the decision can be also if in a, in, in a medical image you have a a bronchitis or, or not, no? and this is the kind of decisions or even well, another type of decision is if this person uh, worth a credit or not. So uh, any decision that we make or any kind of classification uh, can, be, uh, can be decided in a way by a trained algorithms. Okay. Okay, so uh, the discipline has been developed been, uh, during several years and now there is an emerging uh, Emerging technology in a way that uh, the algorithm itself evolved. So the mathematical uh, definition of these uh, algorithms uh, during the cell project has evolved, and there is an important field uh, in machine learning right now. <coughs> that is called deep learning. Probably you know about this, uh, this area. And uh, the different algorithms uh, um, you, can, you differentiate the different algorithms in the way the algorithms learn. So there are different mathematical models behind the different type of algorithms. So in the case of deep learning, deep learning uh, uses a bias-fired model, uh, uh, which is are the neural networks, uh, which is a representation of uh, neurons or uh, uh, interconnected uh, in different layers. So, I'm not going to enter in the detail of the mathematical model, but it's a, it's a very powerful model um, that uh, together with the big amount of data that we 
where you have all with together with the computer capacity of the current uh, machines. So the, the prediction and the capacity of uh, learning data is very, uh, is very, very important. So uh, among the advantages of uh, these uh, deep learning algorithms is that they can uh, automate very much the feature extraction of the data. So the data have uh, many features and these algorithms are able to abstract and have a representation in a vector, very synthesized uh, representation of the data that is uh, in the data set. Where, uh, so in, in this case, uh, usually machine learning algorithms uh, needed uh, a lot of uh, human participation in annotating data classifying this data for the algorithm to learn. So now it's less needed because this kind of algorithms are very, um, very good extracting this information from the data. So what, is, uh, what are the disadvantages of this algorithm? Well, that the mathematical model inside the neural networks is very, very complex, and there is no way uh, to understand how the algorithm learns and how uh, the algorithm gets the decision made, no? So this is maybe, I don't know if this is important in, this, uh, uh, in your sector, in, in, in art, how is the process, how you uh, create the, the decision or the prediction. But for example, in, in, in health, it's very important to know why you have decided that this, this, this uh, image has a, a sickness, no? So there are some part of artificial intelligence that is some application is important to make the decision or the prediction explainable. All right. <coughs> so, <coughs> so, okay. So, uh, deep learning uh, success has been demonstrated in well, in, in many areas right now, but mainly. Uh, in two areas, so uh, in computer vision, so as I said before, artificial intelligence is trying to represent the human capacities. One of the human capacities to see is the vision, so computer vision is a whole area of artificial intelligence where the main uh, focus is in image classification, all right? And there are another area, which is the writing, no, or the language, uh, uh, to speak. And this is also uh, a discipline in, in artificial intelligence that is called natural language processing. So, and uh, deep learning has been also very successful in uh, in automating this task related with language, no? For example, the, the translation or the capacity of synthesized uh, voice or to do voice recognition. These are, uh, this kind of applications, an application that goes through this area of natural language processing. Uh, as I said, so these algorithms have been are very, very good 
in recognizing objects and text and also are very good generating objects based on learning fictions. Okay? There are well, no, plenty of algorithms based in this architecture. So based on the neural network architecture or deep learning, there are many, many algorithms. So two important ones are the ones that spoil convolutional, uh, convolutional neural networks and the generative adversarial network or GAT. No? So, uh, as I said, we are not going to explain the mathematical uh, aspect of deep learning, but I think that this is an interesting video where uh, Jean uh, Cogahan tried to uh, give us an idea of how uh, neural networks. Neural networks, and in particular convolutional neural networks, have been at the heart of many recent research projects. No sé muy bien, Some of the better known ones have been a neural algorithm, artistic style, or style no sé de... deep generator networks, and most. They've also been found within many practical applications, so everything from self-driving cars to speech-to-text systems and neural networks, and in particular convolutional neural networks, have been at the heart of many recent research projects with an artistic flavor. Some of the better known ones have been Deep Dream, a neural algorithm with artistic style or style transfer, deep generator networks, and most recently WaveNets, which learn to generate audio. They've also been found within many practical applications, so everything from self-driving cars to speech-to-text systems and AIs that can play the game of Go. Their recent success comes from an ability to accurately recognize and describe images, but the way they do this remains a mystery to most people. We can get a few intuitions about what's really going on by inspecting them, looking inside them, and seeing how they see the world. What you're looking at is a neural network which is processing my webcam in real time. It scans the image looking for patterns, or what we call features. The patterns look like these. So some are lines or edges or gradients, just really minimal multi-pixel patterns, things like that. And these responses, which we sometimes call feature maps or activations, show us the presence of those features inside of the image. So in the first layer of the network, we've discovered edges, gradients, and patterns like that. Now, things get a little more interesting when we repeat this process many times through a sequence of layers. At each layer of the network, we take the feature maps from the previous layer, stack them together into a new volume of data, and do another round of convolution on top of them. So the activation maps in the second layer, which we're looking at here, are more interesting because rather than looking for patterns from the raw pixels of the original image, we're now looking for patterns from the activation maps of the previous layer of the network. So for example, it might be able to combine vertical edges and horizontal ed edges to detect corners, which we can think of as higher level features. As we do this process many times, progressing through every layer of the network, we uh, acquire higher and higher level features or representations of the image. So we go from things like edges and gradients to corners and grids to yet progressively more complex features, maybe things like leaves or fences or door handles to yet even higher level features, houses, cars, people, and so on. This process of pushing data through the network over many layers of transformations is why these algorithms are sometimes called deep neural networks or deep learning. The deep just means the network has many layers. When we finally arrive at the last layer of the network, we have this compact representation of the content inside of the image. 
and we can attach one more classification layer on top of that so that we can describe accurately what's inside the image. So for example, if I place my phone in front of the camera, it'll go iPod. Or if I place this water bottle in front of the camera, it'll accurately detect the water bottle. Now, it can be a bit hard to understand what the feature detectors are looking for, but it turns out that there are ways, and there has been some work done in the past. Some of the first work came from Rob Zeiler and Matt Fergus in 2013, where they showed patches of actual images, which caused certain feature detectors to light up. Another nice resource is Deep Visualization Toolbox, which was made by Jason Yosinski et al., and was a major inspiration for the visualization software that you saw in the last slide. If you're interested in learning more about how these impressive algorithms work, or even getting your hands dirty and working with them yourself using a series of practical guides and tutorials, I encourage you to check out ml4a.github.io, which is an in-progress free online book about machine learning for artists. So, so this is a video also on this repository uh, of Jane uh, Kogan is very useful to explore different experiments uh, with Google, uh, as in, in particular in, in arts. Okay, so um, so just to mention and uh, maybe to see uh, an example. So in how this uh, neural network works in arts. Well, there are, so, maybe uh, they use one of the, the applications is the neural style transfer. That is, is the optimization technique, so to, to blend two images. So, uh, by optimizing the output image to, ma to match, so they try to match the content and statistics. So these characteristics uh, of the image, um, so the statistical character for the image is using these uh, conventional neural networks, and then uh, these characteristics are applied to new image that you provided as uh, as entrance. So, have you seen this uh, kind of? Uh, no. A ver. So, I imagine that you know this uh, type of. Uh, I don't know uh, this type of application. No. Okay, so, so these are, uh, so there are now many uh, projects that has a, this kind of product where you can play already with uh, some uh, neural networks uh, models. So this, in general, this, uh, this uh, software uses a pre-learned, pre-trained -pre model based on a, a data set. And once you have this uh, a model trained and configured, what you use here is the part of the uh, decision or prediction maker. So the algorithms behind this are already trained and already prepared to do this uh, job, in this case, uh, uh, do this uh, neural uh, style transfer. Okay. Can I ask something? Yeah. Thanks. I was thinking before so about this thing evolution, revolution, and convolution. So as, uh, I think convolution is a kind of a way to see the things a more so like a, a simultaneously uh, trajectory. Uh, in art, for example, it was by concept, conceptual. So you are painting things going from I mean, you don't possess and you don't. Uh, control the information, but it gets there in the 
is hard to express. People tried and tried and tried to find a way of discourses and the languages that school. But uh, while I see the computer science, you can see the project, you can see the, the process, the process how it uh, works. So it's proven. So you can see the algorithms behind very clear in, in a way. Though you are not so sure about um, uh, the quality of the result in a way. It, this is very strange. Because in art, sometimes you have a better guess. Though in computer science, it can uh, uh, maybe not, you, you maybe not like it, but you do. Because it's a very easy process in the end, the result. You can make it until it's the way. But the complexity of these uh, neural networks uh, is, is not easy to, to see and understand uh, how uh, they, they learn. It's, it's, you, you can understand the mathematical functions, but sometimes a, a particular result you don't have uh, an explanation, a clear explanation, or a, a, a clear uh, the set of the steps of course. Uh, for this. But still, uh, it's the most, uh, the most uh, on, on, on show, how can I say, visible, the most visible from all the, from the, these kind of ways of exploring and understanding how information works and yes. how you can use it. Exactly. Uh, exactly. So the the, 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 the other thing is uh, if, uh, is if the result is proper art or not. So it's a, <laughs> this is a different thing, no? So you have this uh, system that are able based on uh, some functions and some previous images to uh, to create or to generate, for example, in this case, a new images. Mm -hmm. But are those images considered art? Are are this uh, en enough uh, innovative or enough uh, enough creative? So this is something that, of course, a machine can't do currently. So this is a still a, a decision that has to be made probably not for one person, but for the society in general. So how we accept the, the result of AI art, uh, and the other thing is that uh, probably right now uh, is, is something that is is on the debate, you know, in, in the debate, and this is part of the ethic uh, of this uh, area, no? I don't know if we have a. Aquí teníamos alguna foto. So this is a, for example, we need, we can play with this. So let me see if we can do it. continue and, and see uh, this uh, later. So I think that this is, so 
more or less, this is an overview of uh, AI. So um, now, uh, deep uh, learning mainly uh, has been using uh, for uh, for making some uh, attempts to to create art with AI. But uh, yeah, uh, talent machine create how how we conceive this part of the um, of the problem, no? So uh, I want to show this interview to Luba Elliot, which uh, is a AI creator, researcher, and consultant. And I think that uh, this is an interview that uh, to her. And it's quite clear what she said about uh, a creative AI. Uh, to me, creative AI means uh, experimenting and uh, working creatively with uh, artificial intelligence techniques in art, music and design. I feel there are so many different uh, technologies being developed by all these kind of large technical corporations and research labs and uh, it's important to experiment and kind of play with them and see how they can be applied um, artistically and kind of um, bring artists and creators and people from the general public into broader dialogue with this technology. drawn into Creative AI around the time of Deep Dream, which uh, came out of one of the Google Research Labs in, uh, I think it was May uh, 2015, and uh, it caused a lot of excitement worldwide because there were all these images that were very multicolored and there were different kind of uh, pagodas and uh, dogs and slugs coming out of uh, kind of humans and buildings. So it was this very kind of psychedelic, crazy imagery that naturally captured, captured the mainstream attention. And uh, I also became quite interested in it because it was an example of uh, this technology being creative in a way and coming up with something that had a very distinct aesthetic. Artists are creative, so are kind of uh, experimenting with uh, very realistic um, kind of image generation to um, sometimes create uh, images of politicians or images of uh, people who have never existed. And uh, on the tech side, you have uh, a lot of uh, kind of experiments with generating anything from kind of recipes to alternative endings to Harry Potter and and kind of so on. Another development is probably the focus on ethics and bias. So given that a lot of these techniques are now um, incorporated into the public realm and into so many different kind of uses in the broader society, many artists are starting to think about kind of the ethics of that and uh, also kind of looking at uh, the data that makes up the data sets and whether and how that has been kind of gathered. Recently there's been a lot of interest in uh, working with creative AI and that has certainly uh, given rise to a number of challenges. And uh, these include, for example, looking at uh, authorship and copyright because normally when you work with these AI technologies there are so many people involved, right? So if you're looking to generate some images, what you normally do is you uh, pick a data set that you either kind of find online or you make yourself, then you work with uh, an algorithm that has uh, kind of an, impl an implementation that was developed by somebody and then kind of finally you also curate the output. So there are different stages in the process and they can also be done by different people in a way. So if you find the, the images online then often the copyright might belong to a variety of different people. 
if you want to work in uh, creative AI, then first of all, I think it's important to have a basic understanding of how the technology works. So I would certainly advise people to experiment a little with generating some text or images or playing around with facial image recognition just to understand how the technology works. It's, uh, it's important for curators like me who specialise in one particular niche to uh, be aware of where that field might be going. So in the case of creative AI, I certainly feel that at some point it will become part of uh, computer art or it might uh, become part of the broader contemporary art field that encompasses a lot of different art forms. So it's, yeah, so you definitely need to be aware of kind of what's happening and where things are going and so on. So, okay. Uh, the, uh, okay. So, well, I, I think that she's uh, quite clear in what is uh, creative AI, but I, I, want to <coughs> I want to say that uh, it's uh, still uh, a kind of artisan uh, experimentation, so uh, it's even we have the pieces of the technology, we have the pieces of data, but it's, it's something that you need to work a, how do you say, a, a artisan, no? it's a craft, no? it's, a, it's a kind of craft, craft uh, work uh, that you need to touch many, many aspects of the of the process and 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 it's also a multi uh, multidisciplinary work. This is uh, I think that uh, the, the one of the main success in in, in creative AI is a, is a work uh, with several teams. Uh, the artists work with developers. Uh, to create uh, more novelty in, in, in the work. So I think that this is a, these are the most important aspects uh, of what creative AI it is right now. So it's experimentation, a lot of experimentation, and uh, multidisciplinarity. Anyway, in art, huh? in art, Anyway, in art nowadays, there is a lot of focus on the purpose of it for the society and for the education. So we have this kind of studies into algae, like science, and then make art from it, and as it was done, like in architectural innovative projects for cities and so so forth. So I think if art can go into this ecological aspect as a, as a kind of a necessity or a thing that makes the art or something. I think art is not so much in the focus now. What I mean is like what can we do good with, with it. So then I, I think like in the science, artificial intelligence thing, the art can, can be encompassed easily if we have like a good point of view in the end, like to do something that makes uh, an even more clear sense in the society. Like. Yeah, yeah, she, she also mentioned that. So uh, the challenge is also to, uh, the challenge also for artists and for creative AI <coughs> is is to transmit, is to explore, is to criticize, uh, uh, to expose these new technologies through the society. All right. So it's also a, a, this is also part of uh, the artistic work. So uh, understand probably or transmit to the to the people the, these new technologies. You no, know, and and how this technologies are, you know, impacting in the society, in culture, so that, uh, that is the challenge, 
uh, at the same time that uh, artificial intelligence is another tool. It's a, it's a new tool, it's another tool for experimentation, for uh, find uh, novel ways to create new contents and, and new concepts, right? <coughs> but I want, I, I want to make sure that this is, is not new. Uh, uh, so, uh, technology has always uh, allowed uh, or facilitate uh, human creativity uh, and, and more and more this emerging uh, collaboration between humans and machines will be, uh, will be a, probably the standard way of producing uh, some part of art or at least a big part of art. Uh, and there is a subfield uh, in artificial intelligence that has been especially uh, dedicated to creativity, to explore, to study, and to mimic creativity in humans. And this is called computational creativity. Okay? So, it's a computational creativity, it's a, it's a big community in artificial intelligence that study uh, building software that exhibit uh, uh, the behavior that can be considered creative in human. So, uh, the community has been active since 1999. And, and it's well established, and there is a, a well established conference that is called uh, the International Conference on Computer Creativity, ICCC. And uh, it is organized by the Association of Computational Creativity. Uh, so, uh, I, we can say that uh, in the last years, also with the movement of open source, uh, computational creativity algorithms are more available for, for different parts of our society, in this case artists, uh, so to, to enhance uh, creativity. All right? So, uh, So I, I think that it's interesting to check if you want to follow a new result uh, uh, in creativity to check this conference and the people who work in, in the conference uh, doing different uh, software for creativity with different approaches. So. <coughs> One of these uh, projects in, in computational creativity is a project that was developed in, in our institute. It's a European project um, that uh, well, uh, is, is inspired in, in cognitive sciences. So there are many work in artificial intelligence that is based on, on research in cognitive sciences and sometimes uh, cognitive scientists work together with uh, artificial intelligence researchers and uh, this, uh, they have been created a, a model based on concept blending. Uh, concept blending is a theory that says that many part of our creative approach is combining uh, concepts, right? You, you have seen this, uh, this is quite a... Okay, so 
this is a project uh, in, in this area, in this case, in the area of music, and, and it, it was presented in the AI Music Festival organized by Sonar. Uh, so we can we can check just a few minutes. So how do you find your ideal clients between a billion people? Introduce. The Chameleon was developed uh, in the context of a European project uh, called CoInvent and this project was about uh, computational creativity and it was developed mainly uh, in, by the group of uh, the University of uh, Aristotle in Thessalonica uh, but it was using uh, the theory and uh, the techniques that were developed in this European project as a whole. Processes are ubiquitous in language and thought. One example could be the mythical creature Pegasus, that comes as a blend between a horse and a bird. One other example could be a boat house, that naturally comes as a blend between a boat and a house. The chameleon melodic harmonization system uh, uses machine learning techniques to analyze and extract harmonic information from music opera. It then uses these extracted features by its computational model in order to produce harmonic blends between two different harmonic styles. One example could be the harmonization of uh, the famous Otto Joy theme by Beethoven. So Chameleon can harmonize this melody uh, according to a pretty tonal uh, harmonic style extracted from Bach chorales, but it also can do it uh, in a jazz style, so a jazz harmonization. Uh, this already is a blend, we call it melody harmony blend. But the most, probably the most interesting thing that Camillion can do is combine two different harmonic spaces, in this case the tonal and the jazz spaces, and produce a hybrid uh, harmonic style that's actually in between these two. So, these pieces uh, of music, classical music in this case, uh, are, uh, has been, were, were, were designed based on harmonizations produced by the software. But what is the need? Because people can do it so much better, like, by themselves. What is the need for this? Is it like the purpose to go for the people who doesn't have this sense of harmony in their lives, in the musical way? Like, to help people? Because for the professionals, I don't see it just like an entertainment and that's all. Uh, so, uh, the idea is uh, it's explore different spaces. So, you can do it by your brain, of course, and with uh, colleagues. Oh. And so, uh, but the what they say, so we have been working with uh, composers and uh, quite important composers uh, in Catalonia. Uh, and he said that for him, it's a source of inspiration. So it's not a many, so the combination, the space of potential combination that has a machine is much more bigger than the one that you... Okay, so maybe from uh, professionals, professionals who are not so experimental. So it's like helping, a tool helping them, because artists are like, uh, you know, this kind of orchestra. 
straws from the street the day they use it. I don't think they think it's it will be like they are better than this, definitely. Yeah, well, uh, you have the tools, uh, you can use this or not. <laughs> so, so I think, I think, I think it really doesn't have to be if it's better or not. It's just like, I don't know, like embracing technology and just figuring out. It's, it's part of the experimental, right? For me, I, I work with technology. Yeah, sometimes like maybe I can do something better, but I, I think that like better in what, like in what, you know, like, very subjective. So for me, it's like embracing the tool and maybe experimenting, just finding new ways, new forms, and I think that actually like feeds me to maybe like, I don't know, uh, I don't know, be better or do stuff better, but exploring, you know, and finally, I guess, getting to know myself better, but I think it's like my main AI can, can make probably some 
great difference in the way we work in fashion, in, in, in fine arts, uh, in broadcasting. Imagine, so visual arts and contemporary arts is, a, is this one area. But uh, uh, thinking of creative industries, you have also video, you have films, you have uh, literature, and so uh, journalism. And, and these tools uh, are now available for all this kind of all these kinds of uh, creative activities, all right? It's like crazy the dog. It's like crazy the dog. Entonces, yeah. The dog is complaining. <laughs> yeah. I need some tool, artificial intelligence silence. <laughs> so, uh, so, I mean, th there are plenty of uh, examples right now. Some uh, uh, similar to others, but uh, this presentation uh, we will uh, provide it to you. So, all these links uh, will be available. Uh, so, Vamos a ver si ahora el teléfono funciona. This is a this is a one technique which is a style transfer and we explained it uh, already that they use uh, the characteristic of, of one style and apply this characteristic of this style to a to an image so you can uh, combine in this kind of also combining uh, concepts. So, <clears throat> there is a, this take time, so working, I don't know if you have been working already with algorithms, that uh, takes time to, to uh, process the information. So, um, this time means uh, computer resources, that uh, taking your word uh, is a sustainability problem. So it's an uh, impact in the environment, all this uh, computational infrastructure. So at the end of the presentation, there is a study, an essay, that probably will be interesting for you, because it's a, it's a in deep exploration of the impact of artificial intelligence in our society. So probably it works for you as an artist to, to read this uh, essay. Okay, so this is a, we can, this is a, the image generated. There are more interesting ones, but yeah, uh, it's simple and you can use this kind of uh, system to, to explore this combination of images uh, with this uh, deep learning algorithms. There is uh, another, another type of uh, algorithms also uh, <coughs> Uh, 
So we, we commented the side transfer. We already saw an example of this. And there is another one um, that is amazing, these algorithms that they create <coughs> from a text, they create an image. Okay? So let's, let's use this uh, pause. Uh, In, in, this, uh, in this application, you have two types of algorithms. One that produces a more artistic uh, result, that is this combination of this uh, neural network, uh, the, the territorial work inside, the generative adversarial network, Luca, uh, together with Clip. And there is another one that is more coherent. So, so most respectful with the with the text and less artistic. <coughs> so these algorithms they are <coughs> they they uh, built the image in different steps. So for, for the experimentation side, uh, you probably, if you use some of these, some of these algorithms, you will, uh, you, you can explore more steps, less steps. So Yes. En, en de lo que conozco de inteligencia artificial, en, solamente conozco dos mundos, ¿no? O sea, la inteligencia artificial, la que nos estás explicando, que es como de a partir de todo el bagaje transformado a algoritmos, pues se crea algo nuevo, o sea, se rediseña, se transforma. Y luego, por otra parte, la inteligencia artificial, la que, por ejemplo, en plataformas como Netflix o y tal, que es inteligencia artificial como desde cero, que de tu comportamiento y luego te genera un trabajo, o sea, te da como un resultado. ¿no? ¿Hay algo más aparte de esas dos vías? O sea que, a ver, Netflix utiliza Machine Learning. Vale. So, y eso se considera. O sea, me diría algo y. Bueno, uh, in Spanish, no. <laughs> so, so she's uh, talking about uh, different uh, approaches of artificial intelligence. So, uh, in Netflix, for, for example, or in general, in e-commerce uh, sites, what you have is a uh, it's an application of artificial intelligence that is called recommender systems. So, some systems of recommendation. And these recommender systems are based on data, but mainly in, a day, in, in, the, in the data of the person. So, the data that they take is your, what is the feelings that you have seen, how many times, what, who you are, and, who, uh, and what you like. And based on this, and based on similar people, similar profiles, and uh, information from these people also interacting with the system, he recommends you 
similar uh, um, content. All right? So um, the majority of recommender systems works in this way. So they take data from you, from uh, other people, and they match the profiles automatically, make a similarity function, and then is able to recommend you this content. This is one part of uh, one application of artificial intelligence that started with uh, Amazon. No, uh, the the algorithms are at that time were called collaborative filtering, and this collaborative filtering algorithms has been applied and developed in many in many places. So. <coughs> This kind of uh, algorithms are also now called generative. So this is a different kind of algorithms that learns uh, characteristics from data that, for example, uh, some of uh, data sets are uh, well established in the community of machine learning. So you can find a data. For example, this kind of algorithms are created with a using ImageNet. That ImageNet has millions of images, and due to its characteristics, with this information, they are able to generate uh, new content similar to the content that they have learned. So, and this is a generative artificial intelligence algorithms. But there are many approaches and many applications uh, of AI. So, this is a, well, this is a landscape uh, from a, created with uh, these algorithms. Uh, and in this case, uh, this, is a, this is a Holly Herdon uh, software that uh, allows you to integrate. Quizás podríamos escuchar esto primero para que se vea la diferencia. So, Holly Herdman has created a, a model a, a, with her voice, with her songs, and with this artificial intelligence, you can apply to different music and generate a Holly Herdman kind of music. Yeah. 
example. So I don't know if you want to uh, stop a little bit or we continue uh, with uh, this part. I think that it's not so long. We are in the middle of the workshop. Are you okay? Um, shall we continue?
porque yo no simplemente no creo en una inteligencia artificial, sino que en la
là aussi, ça peut être un numéro.
hopefully next week we have some what's <laughs> algo que hacer y tienes planes, pues no podemos decirle, oye, pues yo lo hago en 20 minutos, lo puedo hacer en 10, si sí, sí es posible. Vale. Puede ser. Vale. Bueno, no sé si viste los cambios que hice, no sé si te parecen bien. Sí, todo vale. Me sí, me vale. genial, te siento pues, tuyo la presentación, vale, yo, es que, claro, yo, yo puse, puse imágenes para, claro. que, para que sea más dinámica y tal, porque sí. claro, había cosas que como yo no lo he escrito, a lo mejor no me acordaba y digo, hostia, hasta acordarme ahora. Entonces puse imágenes para yo acordarme para que yo se quede. Sí, apaga, apaga. Sí, 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 no, no, nos queda fenomenal. Vale, pues. Eh, okay. Bueno. Uh, ok, so let's go, let's carry on. We are hungry. Ponemos algo muy fuerte, hago música muy fuerte. Let's go. Vale, ya, yo creo ya bueno, eh, this is a so nowadays we can't we can't talk about artificial intelligence without talking about ethics. So uh, because no, these technologies have, uh, are having a huge impact in our society. Uh, <coughs> So, I will say that virtually any organization, any uh, company uh, has now a multiple AI system in place and AI is an integral part of the strategy of the companies and organizations and ethical concerns on AI increases as artificial intelligence takes bigger decision-making process role in industries in all over our society, uh, banking, healthcare, retail, manufacturing, anything. So at the beginning we thought that AI would take Low, low level goals, but the sophistication of the algorithms, the capacity that the algorithms that uh, has already uh, supposes that more and more we support 
our decisions on this recommendation, on these predictions, uh, that uh, the algorithms uh, do. So currently, we can say that uh, AI software made determinations about health, about medicine, about employment, about credit, credit worthiness, and even a criminal justice. So there are some systems that decide if a person is a potential criminal or not. Uh, there are AI systems that uh, recommend or decide if a person worth a credit or not, or if a person uh, is uh, suitable for a job. So, and, <clears throat> and in general, now, in many cases, in many of these applications, we don't know how the algorithms are encoded and how the algorithms are taking these decisions. So, ethics is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a very important. It's a very important aspect. And um, the, uh, the major areas of ethical concerns uh, uh, for our society is privacy and surveillance, so bias and discrimination, and the role of human justice, which is... Uh, so let's see quickly. So I want to, I want to say that uh, this, this concern uh, appears in 2014 uh, through the voices as Stephen Hawking or, or even Elon Musk uh, that they, they rose concern about the potential risk and danger of AI. And in 2017, here in Barcelona, uh, two of our uh, researchers, Ramon López de Mantaras and Luke Steele, uh, presented this, uh, this declaration of how to be the AI development. So <clears throat> they highlight the products, uh, the reliability, the accountability, <coughs> the constraints <coughs> autonomy that should uh, have this uh, technology <coughs> and the human role. So I, I recommend you to explore the declaration because it's a, it's a good explanation of what are the dangers and how, you need, how uh, we need to uh, work with the AI and, <clears throat> uh, and which things we need to take into account for a proper development of this technology and the application. So uh, I will say that now uh, Europe is leading an humanistic view of the AI development. And uh, currently, any uh, research project uh, that uh, is applying for public funding uh, needs to uh, present an ethical assessment. So now there is no uh, public funding if you don't uh, study and present what are the ethical uh, assessment of your uh, future development. So I think that this is an important step on, on this. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to enter in, the, in this aspect in detail, but you know, there is a facial recognition software that is uh, amazing, and all our data is exposed uh, through the different digital application. And only to say that privacy is a big issue uh, right now, and, and it's a big risk. Uh, using artificial intelligence for, by uh, non-democratic government, for governments in general, uh, for companies. 
So it's a very important concern here that we, that, well, the society is trying to deal with. There is also bias and discrimination. So this is such a serious problem. Um, I want to mention that bias and discrimination is a result of preference uh, or exclusions that appears in training data. Uh, it can be introduced on how the data is obtained. So remember that many of these algorithms learn from data and depends on the data, they do a good or bad job. So, uh, but also it's important how algorithms are encoded, what is the, uh, how they are designed and also, they, they can be a bias in the interpretation of the uh, results of the algorithms. So here is a, this is a, Cathy O'Neill is a reference also in this field of uh, big data uh, democracy. And she has a, a this is your a- Your competitor can click on your ads and it can use a lot of money. In fact, you can do that in a suit, flip flops, or. I worked as a mathematician, but then as a quantum finance, I saw the worst of finance. I went into data science, and I was struck by what I thought was essentially a lie, namely that algorithms were being presented and marketed as objective fact. A much more accurate description of an algorithm is that it's an opinion embedded in math. Um, an algorithm is a very general concept. It's something that we do actually in our heads every day. To build an algorithm, we need only two things, essentially, a historical data set and a definition of success. So I build an algorithm to cook dinner for my family. The data that I use on a daily basis is the ingredients in my kitchen, sometimes the time I have, the addition I have for that dinner. And then I assess the dinner after the fact. Was it a success? I define that because I'm the one who's building the meals. I'm in charge, I have the power, so there's always a power element here. So I get to decide a meal is successful if my kids ate vegetables. My kids, if they were in charge, would have defined it differently. And it matters because as we optimize over time, we optimize to success. The succession of meals that I cook from month to month is a very different path of meals than if my son were in charge. So we do that every time we build algorithms, we curate our data, we define success, we embed our values into algorithms. So when people tell you algorithms make things objective, you say no, algorithms make things work for the builders of the algorithms. In general, we have a situation where algorithms are extremely powerful in our daily lives, but there's a barrier between us and the people building them. And those people are typically coming from a kind of homogeneous group of people who have their particular incentives, if it's, if it's in a corporate setting, usually profit, and not usually a question of fairness for the people who are subject to their algorithms. So we always have to penetrate this fortress. We have to be able to question the algorithms themselves, especially when they're very important to us. We have to inject ethics into the process of building algorithms, and that starts with data scientists um, agreeing and signing to a Hippocratic Oath of modeling. But we have to stop blindly trusting algorithms to be fair. They are not inherently fair. And start looking into what they're actually doing. Okay. I think this is a very simple way to understand what is going on with the data, how you build the algorithms. So, uh, uh, so the, uh, there is a, there is moral, social, and political implication in technologies. We build the technology, so our values are embedded in everything that we do. So our values is in the technology too. Uh, so we need to find out the way to uh, create a 
starting with the more diverse teams in, in the building of these technologies, for example, this uh, multidisciplinarity between artists and technologies uh, will be fantastic for the industry. So <coughs> this is important. So uh, I want also to uh, to show this uh, video uh, about a uh, bias. So I think that is a. Uh, This is a movie. During my first semester at MIT, I got computer vision software that was supposed to track my face. It didn't work until I put on this white mask. I'm thinking, all right, what's going on here? Is it the lighting conditions? Is it the angle at which I'm looking at the camera? Or is there something more? That's when I started looking into issues of bias that can creep into technology ideas about technology that we think are normal are actually ideas that come from a very small and homogeneous group of people. Vast amounts of data at incredible speeds. Everybody has unconscious biases and people embed their own biases into technology. This kid got stopped as a result of facial recognition misidentification and then used that as justification to search you. This is an innocent child. Racism is becoming mechanized. Systemic issues are only going to be hardwired into new technologies. It's not just face classification, it's any data centric technology. Every day we are all being scored. Who gets hired? Who gets housing? I am making predictions for your life right now. The people who own the code deploy it on other people, and there is no accountability. Management and Atlantic Towns wanted to install the facial recognition software. Pretty much turned this place into Fort Knox. The technology is being rapidly adopted and there are no safeguards. We are socially controlled in a way that we don't see. Technology that analyzes faces could be biased, but the company is pushing it anyway. What demographic is it most effective on? White men. Show me that it's going to be fair, that it's legal, before you put it out. That's what we don't have yet. It's going to take people coming together, driving for justice in this age of automation. Okay, so it has been interesting, this analysis. Uh, and now uh, I think that there is a revolution on ethics and AI. So uh, uh, there is a whole branch of researchers working on ethics for AI. So uh, <clears throat> that is good. That is good. Explainable AI, responsible AI, trustworthy AI, so systems that are able even to embed uh, our values, so value awareness algorithms, to try to deal with these uh, problematics. Okay, so uh, finally, in this part of, uh, well, I, I want also to mention the, the other aspect that is the human, the role of the human adjustment. Uh, this is a, this is, this part is less uh, commented in the media, but I think that it's uh, very important. So there is the impression that human intelligence is no longer needed. And we are replacing uh, employees, uh, people by AI systems. All right? But AI system uh, itself requires the human expertise requires the human data. So if you replace the human, there will no opportunity even to create uh, this kind of systems. So uh, human expertise need, needs to, to 
continue to be thought, developed and exercised because this is the source of everything. So there is now there is no a separate intelligence that is able to understand everything. So they are still algorithms and, and we need ourselves for understanding and also for producing this uh, technology. All right? So this is a this is the one of the <clears throat> in, in the case of creative AI well, there are there are also concerns uh, what is uh, AI, what is a, a, a creative artificial intelligence, no? In this case, this is a, not, maybe because of time, I'm not going to, to show you this, but you can see it later on. And this is a work where a, a team produced a Rembrandt a piece of art. So, very similar to the Rembrandt one. So there is a new Rembrandt around us that is an artificial intelligence. Do we assign a creative value to this uh, type of uh, work? <coughs> so, <coughs> so what is a, a creativity in this way? No. So uh, in this case, uh, we need to be able to differentiate piracy and plagiarism uh, from the originality and creativity. We need to be able to recognize the work of the human creator, to the, the, the artist. We need to decide which part uh, um, is adequate, uh, how we need to pay artists, if this kind of technology will substitute the role of the artist in our society. So, this aspect uh, needs to be uh, studied and needs to be analyzed and probably uh, you as an artist uh, have a, a word on uh, what will be the, the impact and how we will uh, work together with this kind of creative tools. There is a, so for making a responsible uh, artificial intelligent art, there is this uh, very interesting, uh, very nice uh, guide. Uh, so in the different, uh, so there are different steps right now, and in each step we need to take care about ethics different aspects, uh, selecting the data sets, uh, selecting the model, the training results, and also communication. Uh, this is a... Uh, this is a very, very nice document uh, from this project, which is a partnership on AI. And, uh, it, it uh, is a pathway to different aspects of the, uh, the checking points in the process. Uh, very well documented. Uh, I, I suggest you to follow it uh, and, and check what are the check point for making a responsible AI. Laura, papa. Okay. Well, then you have the the fakes. So this is another uh, so the fakes are synthetic media in which a person in an existing image is replaced by another person. Um, 
there is this uh, company called Metaphysics that are able to create these uh, hyper-realistic uh, videos automatically. Um, I don't know if you have seen this. This is a... What is not real? Uh, in this uh, in this world now. <laughs> so when I was 26 years old, barely out of grad school, I was asked to come teach a half-day class about the So thank you, Mark. So this uh, this is a uh, this book is uh, uh, very interesting and it's an open, in a totally an open subject. <laughs> so, uh, it's, uh, one of the main application lines in artificial intelligence is cyber security. So, it's a big issue, big issue, and there are many people training <coughs> and learning how to also build system to, to fight with this kind of uh, with this kind of this misuse of the uh, of the uh, this technology and finally this is a, another important subject one of your colleagues was mentioned and uh, that is sustainability so Currently, this model takes a lot of computer uh, computer uh, uh, computer processing, and this is a this is an area. There are uh, many people working on having a green AI uh, reduce the carbon impact of these technologies and. Here is the, there are some initiatives uh, around this. For example, uh, <coughs> this is for researchers to calculate the impact of the experiments. No? Uh, they use power time, the hours invested in, the, in running the algorithms because um, once the model is created, uh, more or less uh, the algorithm uh, runs uh, fast uh, for, yeah, for the classification or decision process, but for the creating the models, the learning models, sometimes there are, it, it takes days. So it's a lot of uh, computer resources. Uh, and, and this is the, the, this, uh, the, say, the article that is the uh, anatomy of AI system. This is a beautiful map uh, about what is the supply chain of artificial intelligence from, you know, from the air extracting the lithium or all the components that are required to create the computers. Uh, also, people that uh, need to annotate data, the programmers, the, the clouds, uh, the computer centers. 
So it's, it's very interesting to, to see the system as a whole uh, and the implication in, in our society. And uh, Yeah, and I think that uh, this is uh, more or less everything that I wanted to to comment you about uh, this part. So uh, you can uh, we prepare. <coughs> so a little uh, exercise. Uh, I don't know if you know this. Uh, Collaboratory, which is a is a environment uh, developed by Google Research that allows uh, to write and execute a, a code online in, in the browser, and it is special uh, specially suitable for machine learning, data analysis, and education. And many people uh, is sharing. Uh, is sharing uh, they work they code uh, through these notebooks there are plenty of notebooks that we, we can we can play with and uh, this is an example of uh, this um, this neural network, uh, the VQGAN plus click, the one that we saw previously in in in, in the in the demonstration. Here there are there is a tutorial both in Spanish and in in English on how uh, you can use this uh, particular. Uh, algorithm in, in collab so we can we can see it uh, quickly <laughs> at least to show you the environment uh, which is a uh, so this is the browser this is the the collab is connected with the Google Drive, so in Google Drive you can leave your data uh, when one is required, and you can execute uh, the algorithms uh, here. So uh, for that you need to first connect uh, connect to a execution machine. So. And these are different steps uh, in the algorithms, the different steps that you uh, need to... So now that you are connected, you, you check. So this is the... You accept the license for using this uh, code. Uh, this is a two-step where you, uh, you can decide to do an integration with your Google Drive or you uh, integrate with your folder in your drive. We are not going to use this. So right now <coughs> it's, it's optional. So first around here you run the setting of of the libraries for your for the code uh, of the of this algorithm. So the problem with this is that it takes time. So maybe four minutes, I think, depending on the yeah. network. So maybe. I don't know. Maybe we can do this at the end, or exactly. We we can we can check this at the end. Okay. And um, you can leave it, and you can continue with. Might we continue with the metaverse presentation? So, uh, um, yes. And if needed, I will.
say something, but no. Okay. <coughs> it's cold here. All right, so I'm going now to talk about the metaverse. Um, I think you already know what the metaverse is. Do you, one volunteer to, that wants to explain what is the metaverse. That we already saw this in the <coughs> workshop, the John points. You know? I haven't been convinced by any information. Okay. <laughs> All right, so metaverse, the first time that appeared in the history was in the snow crash, okay? in the Neil Stevenson, 1992. But the definition of this metaverse, in my opinion, is old. The definition is that this is a metaverse, a large, open, shared, and persistent 3D environment world. But the metaverse won't be really this in the future, because the uh, metaverse wants to be innovative. And as you know, we already have 3D environments shared nowadays. So, uh, the definition, uh, it's more like uh, a concept, you know, more like the new internet. And this is related to the decentralization, you know, to the blockchain. So, in my opinion, and I think we can all agree that the metaverse is like the new internet where we can share everything at the same time, but decentralized using blockchain. For example, if, if we have an NFT, maybe, in a blockchain, Ethereum, maybe, we can Catch, get this hash code of the block inside the blockchain and we can share it in that buildings inside the metaverse. We can speak more about this later. So this is the first the first time that appeared. And then the metaverse is not just a digital world. In my opinion it's more like a physical and digital. It's called physical short. And yeah it's a combination. It's not just virtual. We have to innovate, right? So, um, the, I want to say something special here. The, you, you, you can't create the metaverse because the metaverse is already created. You have to build in the metaverse. Nowadays, there's like a race in the, the big fish companies like Meta, like you know, Nvidia with the Omniverse. They want to own the, the metaverse, but in the reality, they want to to build the, the, the huge building. It's like Google in the internet, so Meta is like the Metaverse, or Omniverse in the Metaverse. So, what we have to do? We have to use the SDKs that these companies are providing us, and we have to build bridges between the, the, this micro Metaverse, you can say. So, uh, yeah, it's like, uh, it's like internet, but with, between a lot of chunks. And the Metaverse, as the internet is in expansion. So these are the seven layers of the metaverse. But I want to show you something. These three first layers, four first layers, you can apply this to game development, to internet applications, multimedia solutions. But the most important thing here is these three, the core, the core. The, the infrastructure, we have new infrastructures nowadays. We are in the future we will be new infrastructures. Like human interface, we have now the VR glasses, I know you, you know these, these new VR glasses that are like, like glasses, literally, and you can connect it to your, your mobile phone, this is awesome. Then the most important part, this decentralization. This is what makes the other layers important. We have to decentralize the metaverse. As I told you, um, if you have one NFT in one blockchain, you can prove the existence of that. You have just to check that code, right? It's incorruptible. Um, yeah, so let's step in the AI uh, using the metaverse. So, as you can see here, I put a PNG, an image, because in my opinion, the AI is just a solution for a lot of problems that the metaverse is creating. So, yeah, how can we parse emotions and non-verbal language in the metaverse? Boom. Deep learning. It's a solution, you know? Um, like, how can we auto-regulate, like YouTube, you were saying, you, we can use neural networks or creating of avatars, deep fake. It's, there's a solutions. So now let's check this video, which I think is super cool. Um, yeah, 
this could be an application for the metaverse because this is offering solutions to the user. You know, here you are connecting to the metaverse. Perithium, build me a modern downtown office. Then this is here. Load nature background. Load downtown background. Obviously, you have a database with all of these. And Turn the wall red. But here the AI is recognizing your Send hands, the parsing into the machine, and Send then the searching on the couch. using your board in the database. Add a laptop. Face the table. This is getting more and more and more complex. Remove the laptop. Replace the TV stand with a flip chart. Add an ashtray to the table. Suggest materials. Uh, this one. Mm, this one. Okay, this one. Remove the cell phone. Replace the computer with a typewriter. Scatter paper around the desk. Suggest variations. This one. Thank you. Mm, let's try a Citizen Kane poster here. Try a Red Shoes poster here. So imagine this is a uh, decentralized data that is in the blockchain and you can share your own <coughs> with everybody. In the, all of the buildings in the metaverse, as I told you. So, yeah, now we're going to talk about the whole of conduct in the metaverse. You know, nowadays in the internet, uh, almost everybody is anonymous, and you can, you can speak with people, and you can attack people without consequences. This is wrong, you know? Uh, I mean, if I'm talking with you in the Zoom call, I won't attack you because it's like one face-to-face. No, it's not lively. So we have to create a metaverse where you can be more face-to-face -face with people. You can talk like more lively style. So we have to design uh, ethical AI solutions for this to improve the code of conduct in the metaverse. We don't have to be that that cold like internet is. Um, yeah, it's going to also it's going to regulate the, the industry. The industry is going to regulate this. Um, as the metaverse is getting um, more close, uh, come faster. So, ah, yeah, this is the uh, Fortnite. I don't know if you participated in one of the events of Fortnite, like the concerts of show, like Marshmallow. So this is so interesting because it's the beginning. It's a little part. It's the base. Here, a lot of people, like millions of users, could um, enter, join a concert. And enjoy. It is, and it was like a real concert, but at home. Yeah, it sounds basic, but it was so cool because it was like new and nobody did that. So then Roblox is using also AI to a lot of solutions, like machine learning to moderate gameplay and ensure the players are breaching community guidelines. Roblox is using also the AI to guide some of the non-players, uh, the NPCs, to make the, the game more realistic, you know, and it's also using, using um, yeah, machine learning to, to teach models, and, and that's it. And yeah, we're going to, to talk now about avatars. This is so cool because in the last residency, the last image residency, we almost used this in Unity plugin to to make people feel more near in the, in, the, in the VR application that we developed. This is an application that you can take a selfie, actually, and uh, it creates you an avatar using AI. And you can uh, do the set dressing to the avatar, and it's, it's super nice. <coughs> so this is a solution for the metaverse using AI as well. Yeah, digital humans. So 
Uh, in this case of the, of the meta human creator, the developers can animate digital characters in minutes, as you can see here in this link. This is getting. Do I hear a thank you for saving my life coming? Do I hear a thank you for saving my life coming? Do I hear a thank you for saving my life coming? You can create super fast um, this kind of animations. You know, in the in the past. Uh, art, uh, artists and uh, programmers spend a lot of time doing this. Now it's it's instant time. So, yeah. Also, the language processing uh, users uh, from all over the world be able to communicate with uh, a lot of let's call it entities or NPCs that I'm afraid, but it seems like um, every day it's more like naturally as you can see here in this link you can check this woman let's chat with her if you want. i'm afraid because in the future this uh, will seem hi there i'm sophie we can, we what can. should i call you hello sophie i am mark nice to meet you Super. I'll call you Hello Sophie, I'm Mark Nice to meet you from now on. <laughs> okay. How old are you? I'm 30 years old. Okay. L let's ask her something that cannot do, okay? Sophie, could you show me your hands? Sure. Here you go. Sophie hands her hands over the webcam. <laughs> Okay, so it gets glitched. It's not perfect, okay? But uh, I don't know if you remember the first version of Cleverbot. It was a, bot, a chat bot that you can ask him, I, yeah, him questions. So this is uh, the new version where there's a non-verbal language. What we will need it for sure in the metaverse, the non-verbal language. And then uh, there's voice recognition. I don't know the, um, the system, the back end, but I think it's GPT GP3 maybe, but I don't know. So this uh, parts your voice, it, it translates in the text, and then it puts in the GP3, and then the reverse. So this is so interesting, because in the future, maybe we have to do Turing test. I think he said already explained it. So uh, think about what would happen if we as a human beings improve the realism of the AI, digital humans, yeah, at some point that the user won't notice that you are uh, talking with a human, uh, uh, with an AI. So the, the behavior of the, that AI, it's like human. So this test uh, is that if you, detect, you can detect it or not. So if the AI starts learning the behavior of the humans, it's possible the singularity, I don't know. The major elements of machine learning and artificial is learning data, you know? Imagine that, that AI, that you know, don't, don't know if it's exactly the human or AI, starts learning from himself. It could be something post-apocalyptic, but yeah, we have to be afraid. And we can also uh, code this or design this with the Asimov laws. I don't know if you know the Asimov laws. There's a lot of, there's like three Asimov laws that are recursively. I mean, this, this, the first one is a law, the second is a law, but it's, uh, it is supporting the first one, and the third one is supporting the first and the second one. So it's like you have to make like a puzzle. So, so yeah, if you want to, to work in the metaverse, you, you can work on this. If you have these skills, you can work on the metaverse to create. But I think that in the end, every, everybody can use this the case that, for example, uh, meta is, is giving us. So, but yeah, there are skills of development. But if you're a normal user, uh, for example, now you can create a YouTube video for the internet. For so, in the future, you can create, I don't know, a room using that voice uh, recognition that we saw uh, for the meta. So, but this is to work and improve nowadays. Um, so this is some of ch the challenge that we talk. The AI implementations can run into uses and not have the ability to detect problems. This will be a challenge, yeah. 
and there's more if you want to read. Yeah, and finally the platforms. We have the that one that I mentioned in Nvidia with the, the Omniverse, uh, Unity, Facebook that is called Meta now. There's a lot of uh, platforms. There's a lot of games as well. Um, but in my opinion, maybe for example, Minecraft is an old definition of the concept of the metaverse. But yeah, it's it's necessary. We need this because it's the base. It's the beginning of it. Of everything. So, and finally, the education. I don't know did, did, if you want to mention something about well, this. Well, I, I, in this case, I only want to mention that in the metaverse there are uh, opportunities for doing different kinds of applications. But I think that one of the very interesting application in the metaverse will be education. So you can use uh, immersive environment to educate people and to play with, uh, to play learning or learning by doing, learning by playing. So <coughs> the, there is a uh, area that is called uh, serious games and these serious games are using a virtual reality and augmented reality for the purpose of learning. So. This is a very useful approach uh, using this technology of the metaverse and artificial intelligence. Um, this is our two examples of projects uh, that we have been working on for the education purpose. So it's only this. <clears throat> yeah, and here are jobs if you want to check out. Yep, and that's it. I don't know, Lizette, if you want. Yeah, well, this is a, a <coughs> so it's almost uh, one thirty. So yep, we, uh, we we can check uh, the <coughs> the model. So the the, the the algorithm, the system. So we 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 install uh, the libraries. Uh, needed to run this uh, uh, example. So, uh, in this part, you use the model. So in this case, the model, as I said before, the model are created uh, using training data, specific training data. So then here, you have different model based on this sub data sets. Different data sets are suitable for different problems. For example, for uh, uh, face recognition, if you want to store face recognition, you can better use face, this, uh, this model. But for ge general images, as the one that we have been seeing in the different uh, project of uh, site comfort, uh, we can use a uh, image net which is the, so we select these two uh, models uh, with the data sets. So it's processing, so the, the, the algorithm is uh, loading uh, the information. Yeah. This will probably take. Uh, okay. Maybe in the, in the meantime, if you have questions, or you can ask. Yeah, we can. We can. I don't know. Yeah, we can talk about. What do you think? Any question that comes to mind for me with the AI stuff, so particularly talking about the outcomes and objectives for AI. When training, sorry, training algorithm um, is whether there's any ambition or technology in the moment that attempts to capture sort of non monopolistic um, like I suppose what I'm thinking is a lot of the values that people have or a lot of the things that matter to people, it might not be possible to express a language or code. So I wonder if there's a way to try and like 
bridge that gap. The gap, the gap, I guess, the, of, of language, right? Between computers and people that don't actually talk the coding language. Not just the coding language, but like there are a lot of what people are within is not expressible by any language. So, so people, you know, for example, through behaviour, they express their values and contents in all sorts of ways, yeah. And, and I just wonder if in that collaboration between AI and people, if there is, I suppose it, um, it's like how dynamic of the objective to the algorithm be or how, so it's probably the whole question. <laughs> um. Well, I, I, maybe you are talking about uh, how could be early in the future the interaction uh, between us and the machines, no? If we will, uh, if, if will we have a more intelligent interaction? So I, I, I don't know if your question is uh, about this. So, computers at this time, it doesn't know nothing about what they, what they are doing. Sure. No, they, they, there is no conscience, the, no conscience, no? The, the, the machine don't think. So, they don't think. They learn. They learn from data and they are able to uh, produce a, an answer, but they don't understand what they are doing. So the, the, the machines are not uh, beings in terms of they don't have conscience. So the interpretation and the interaction with the machines are the interpretation that we do. What they contain, the algorithm contains, as in the video, the Cadio Milo video, is, is our interpretation of the output or the success. So uh, we are now maybe considering that what is uh, doing uh, this uh, kind of software in dream or this kind of algorithm. It's good. We 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 saw this and, and decide that okay, this this is very similar to art, or this can be considered art. But the machines, they don't know anything. Sure. So we are not in the level of this uh, in the level of the development of AI where uh, uh, there is a common sense or there is some consciousness so we are some people are studying this are trying to get into this but at this time we are not in this uh, level of development of the AI what, what, what would you consider as you look like personally what would you consider is like uh, like the best outcome AI practices for, I would say, the world. Personally, well, AI is a, it's like a software. It's a informatics. It's a, it's computer science. So, and it's a very uh, horizontal. AI can be applied to any problem more or less, to solve any problem. So what is a so good problem for AI, for example, in medicine, so solving, you know, detecting, uh, the early detection of a cancer, for example, is a, is a good, uh, fantastic application for AI. So the physician needs to, to understand, to learn, and to uh, understand images. So, so 
some algorithms uh, are very, very, very good for that. So, <coughs> for example, autonomous drive. So this is another very interesting application of AI that is it will it will be delivered soon. So uh, cars that can uh, drive by themselves, which is a imply some security, so solve some security problems, mobility problems too. So uh, AI can be applied to uh, personalize uh, information for education also. So uh, I think that there are plenty of opportunities to, to use uh, AI for, for good. Actually, there is a there is a, 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 a platform that is called AI for Good, where uh, they are also disseminating many results in, in areas where AI is applying for the uh, sustainable development objective. So. Uh, I don't know if I'm answering yeah. with you. So, but it's a technology that, in principle, can be applied uh, to many, many problems. Many problems, so to, to choose the problem that you want to solve. <laughs> Do you think there will always have to be a human in the loop? to make a value judgment. I, 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 wonder, I think it's making me think like, you know, if there's a point where AI already an algorithm can be uh, oblique, like we can't see how it works, um, I guess the only way we can currently work with that is to have people in the loop to sort of say, like, do you think that's how it should always be, or do you think it'll be a point where we can trust AI to like, Yeah. No, no, of course. Uh, yeah, in the development, in general, in software development right now, uh, there is a, it's very important to, to co create, to co create with, with users, with potential users um, uh, of the system. So, this is a trend. But it is also a very important trend in, in the trustworthy AI development. So involve uh, the people, uh, make people participating in the design of the systems. Uh, yes, it's, a, it's, it's very important and something that I think that more and more uh, it's a methodology. It's a methodology uh, for the design of these uh, software systems. Of course, you can't control everything that is, will happen. For example, at the beginning of the social network, we didn't thought, we didn't think that will be uh, so dropbacks. So big problem for, for example, if you are doing face recognition and you develop all this algorithm, it's difficult sometimes to predict the misuse of the technology. So also it's a matter of education. So educating people, trying to uh, to find a way of uh, no uh, inform inform the society, inform the developers, inform the users about how to use these technologies. No. But yes, the methodology is, is important to involve uh, users and to also to have a multidisciplinary teams. No? Uh, people nowadays uh, teams in Software development, AI development, development, development are people that come from design, some from psychology, some from mathematician, physics, and sometimes someone uh, in the area of education, for example, a physician or an architect. So, this is.
is also important. Bueno, uh, okay, we finish this. Uh, le hacemos esto. So these are uh, some few parameters of these uh, uh, algorithms. Uh, you can play with the size, with the, you, you need to decide the model. In this case, we are going to use the, this model and, and So here you decide this is the input, what kind of uh, image you uh, want wants to create. You select the, you run the parametrization, and then you can execute. You can execute the uh, the algorithms for generating uh, images. Okay, so this is so this is are the steps of the algorithms. You can run it in your browser, it's very simple, and you can play with this and also you have the 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 coding. So the algorithms, all the instructions in Python are there. So if you want to do or uh, explore more how the algorithm works. What is the programming behind the algorithms? In these notebooks, you have a uh, main uh, information block of software that you can reuse and share with the community. So uh, these uh, these are several iter iterations uh, every. A 50 iteration, it generates uh, a new image. So you can do so many iterations as you want. <laughs> and the image is more and more uh, 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 ready. No? Let's see what is the second one. And then I think that we can finish the workshop here. So in the, in the presentation, uh, there is the link for this document and there is a link uh, for another document with more examples. Uh, this is very slow here because of the, of the Wi-Fi. So the network is important for working with artificial yes. intelligence. <laughs> so working with a with machine and a good network uh, if not, you are going to desperate <laughs> with the uh, execution time. So here is the, the document for more uh, exercises. And here you have uh, a repository of uh, example of uh, experiments uh, with Google, uh, the Jim Common uh, <coughs> collabs that are very, very good. And mm -hmm. uh, this is our news. Uh, this is the Artificial Intelligence European Hub. That is, uh, this platform is uh, for very good and uh, well-known researchers on artificial intelligence in Europe. 
This is a, a project uh, with music, tool for music and, and that's it. I think that uh, hope you have a, a lot of resources to play with and to learn about how to use artificial intelligence in your work. So uh, thank you for coming and yeah. Thank you for being It's a pity that Xavier Saturna couldn't come, but yeah, it was personal problems. Ah, so. uh, yeah. So if you all have questions, uh, you can ask also Xavier. I will uh, I will put uh, his mail. So he's a big professional. So if you have more questions, you can ask him as well. Uh, as he said. Okay. 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 Let's see what. Deja, deja ver si, a ver si se ve la primera imagen.